Hello again, Grapple fans. Yes, it's a while since I said those words, but tonight we've got a very special show for you as we meet once more some of the great wrestlers who graced our screens every Saturday afternoon for more than 33 years. From the South, those old rivals Mick McManus and Jackie Mr. TV Palo. From Salford, remember Mark Rollerball Rocco. We've young Robbie Brookside from Liverpool, the immortal Les Kellett, and who could forget that masked man of mystery, Kendo Nagasaki. So, sit back and enjoy British wrestling at its best from the days when everything stopped at four o'clock. Saturday afternoon was wrestling day on TV. Everybody who had a television set, four o'clock, wrestling. If you're 30 and over, you know. If you're under 30, you've heard of me. There was a lot of good looking fellows, a lot of good bodies. You know, sex, in those days, to see a man's body was very rare unless you went to the beach. It was Coronation Street with real baddies and goodies, blood, sweat and tears. It was an absolute theatre of, of magic. We go with round one of eight fives. Seconds out, the first round. Wrestling is as old as time. I mean, it's like prostitution. If you look at the hieroglyphics in the Egyptian tombs, they, they, they have drawings of wrestlers. Wrestling, as long as there's a big body and a, and a good goody, there'll always be wrestling. It, it, it's, it's inherited in people. Wrestling is a very northern thing as well. There's Olympic wrestling, which is what they do in the Olympics, and amateur wrestling. But the style of wrestling with submission holes and all that business is originally based from Wigan. So the, the people that came to the front of that were from Wigan, and they were probably coal miners originally. We used to promote anywhere from the Guildhall in Plymouth to the Music Hall in Aberdeen. You name it, we run it. There isn't a hall in this country or in a town that we haven't put wrestling on. Every town in England had a wrestling show in the midfield mid-fifties. You know, I wrestled for seven nights a week and never went to the same town more than twice a year. Everyone in Manchester used to come to Bellevue on Saturday night. They didn't go to the pub to get to Bellevue. Kids came to go to the theme park. The, the dads used to come to the, to the speedway. The mums used to come and watch wrestling. Saturday night here was unbelievable. City Centre, where here it doesn't look much now, but you won't believe what a, what a place this was. It was a 6,000 indoor seater. It smelled, it tasted, it felt like a like like a fighting arena. In the golden days of wrestling, everybody was looking for a bit of fun, and they asked me so many years ago if I would be a referee at a charity match, and I said no. Nope won't be a referee, but I'll fight. And they said, you'll get killed. And I said, no, because you can train me up. <laughs> so I did my first fight, which I lost in a spectacular manner, to uh, a gentleman who was the welterweight champion of the world, gentleman Jim Lewis, who had uh, a temper as long as his thumbnail. And <laughs> I fought it five times, you give me five good idings. Lewis is very angry. Oh! Vicious fist. Oh! A sickening rabbit. Oh, the referee's down! In come the, in come the seconds. No, oh, they're killing him. They're killing him. Why, the whole place is murder. And it was my proud claim that I lost my first 35 fights. Mr. Savile! Mr. Savile! Are you enjoying yourself, Mr. Savile? Mr. Savile! 
entirely sure why they were so popular, but they were ginormously popular. I mean, I was a pop star uh, at that time, and I know the difference between being popular and not popular. And these guys had a special niche in the, in the love of the public, and the public sort of loved them. Even if they hated them, they still loved them. This is it, the Royal Albert Hall in the art of London. I've packed it about six or seven times. I sold it out once with Mick McManus, double price. They had a charisma, they style, they had an individuality. It's like there's thousands of pop groups here playing in clubs and pubs all up and down the country, very glamorous young boys but they've no more chance of making it because they're not original. These men were all original and individual personalities. Billy Two River. Billy Two River is a fantastic character. Mohawk Indian from the Conawaga Indian Reservation. And another one. Double-handed shopping. Here we go. Big Daddy, of course, is my dear brother. Think a lot about him. I'll call him Shirley, because Shirley was his name, and only I used to call him Shirley. That is it. Must be it. Yeah, 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 Cat Weasel. Funny, I ain't know what his name was, Cat Weasel. Gary Cooper. Trying his stats. Oh, God, what a man. He was a big, awkward, awesome character, and um, the public hated him. It wasn't showbiz, it wasn't uh, the pop business or anything like that. Wrestling was on a special mountain all of its own, and it was a peak of its time. Well, I don't know about you at home, but here at ringside, we can't hear ourselves think at all. I think like most people, I got interested through the television. I watched it on television when I wasn't playing football on a Saturday afternoon. And unfortunately for me, my father used to come in from work at approximately four o'clock, and I'd have the wrestling on, and he totally despised the wrestler that I used to just watch the different styles and the different performances of the wrestlers and the, the ability that they had. Television is magic. I mean, there's no question about that. Let's face it. It is magic. If you get on television, good, bad or indifferent, it can kill you stone dead, of course, at the same time. But, um, <coughs> but um, invariably, if you're on the television in something, all of a sudden, from a non-entity, you are suddenly well known. People stop me in the street. People have a go at me, hoot their hooters at me. I mean, it wasn't a taxi driver that didn't know me. You know, good night, fellow. So many millions of people like, that knew me and knew of me or used to watch. And uh, so consequently, I should do you know, lots of interviews and some advertising and uh, got in, in, invitations to places which I would never have gone, you know, that was including Buckingham Palace and, and uh, Downing Street and places like that. I would never have gone there, you know. Uh, met a lot of people that, uh, under normal circumstances I've never met. I was instantly sort of recognisable, for some of, I, I still am in that sense, and, uh, and it was very good really. All of a sudden they're on TV, there's a, a lad from the pub, all of a sudden on TV, he's a household name. And it was hard for a lot of people to live with that, including myself. I mean, I was thrown in at the deep end at 16, 17, on the TV, making lots of money, sports cars and girls, and running around. And it was a rock and roll lifestyle. I mean, I was running around in, the, in those days like yeah, I was in Utopia, you know, men, all girls all over the place and loads of money and all the rest of it. It was great. We drew a bigger audience than the actual cup final. That was fabulous. And that was like official, that came out in the newspaper and everything. More people watched that than watched the cup final. Oh, well, we've only had one round. Probably the hardest man ever in the wrestling business. Les Kelly was a legend within the business. Everyone was scared to death of Les because he was so powerful. Hard nut, a very hard nut. Uh, no one could take liberties with Les Kelly ever, believe me. I was hard in this respect. I wouldn't stand any nonsense from him. That wasn't just in the ring. That was in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> to watch him work, in the ring, you thought, he's going to call his father, isn't he lovely? Being there with him, 
I would sooner go in there with three wrestlers than wrestle less. Because if Rez was in a bad mood, bye bye. Nobody likes me. I'm talking about wrestling now. No, no, nobody in the wrestling likes me. Not by any means. And I'm quite well aware of it. Nobody makes a monkey out of me, boy. Put Les Kelly on with Leon Harris. Remember Ryan Glover from the uh, advert Typhoon Tips? That would be a great match, because Brian Light was all that bouncing about, up and down, come on, and all that, and Lezard, side, slap him off the face, nearly knock your bloody head off, Lezard, hands, fingers like bananas. Let's see how strong you are, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> to the millions, Les Kelly was a funny man. But Les really wasn't. Les were a hard man. Hard in every way. His whole life, was that of never giving to pain. You've got to be able to scrap. That's like the ordinary fellas in the street. Uh, and if you can't do that, you might as well give over with some of the fellas. I never talked to him. I was in the job a long, long time and never, and that's true. I mean, people th say, oh, he's joking. You know, he's, he used to take his mask off and go and have a pint. That's not true. Logan going for the mask. The crowd right with him. They want that mask off. There is only one Kendo Nagasaki. I must put that on record. There's only one. He signs autographs, he doesn't speak, never spoken, never spoken in public, ever, and that won't change. Kendo used to get to a wrestling arena and had to have his own dressing room. He always had an entourage with him. He came in a Rolls Royce. He sat somewhere where no one could find him. No one knew where he was. He had uh, people doing things for him. He was a, an, an elusive mystery man, and he is to this day. Kendo, what kind of reaction did you get from the crowds when, when you were fighting? When did you first decide to become a wrestler? The real making of Kendo was when he took on board a manager who was George Gillette, who became, of course, Gorgeous George. Well, George used to put all the fancy makeup on. The fans would really be ecstatic and go over the top because he was this manager portraying the role of a homosexual and the mass mystery man. And Kendo would go in the ring and he he could iron him out. At uh, uh, Stoke on Trent, uh, a fella got out of his uh, seat, run to the ringside and, and, and got all of his foot, like with the toe and the ankle, and give it that. He jumped straight out of the ring in Kendo and they took the fella to the hospital. Because he, he, didn't just, he didn't just stop, you know, and give him one or say, well, say sorry and I'll let you go. He didn't do that. He belted him, really, really belted him. Which, like, isn't good, really, because the fellow wasn't there the next week. Over the top of the flying tackle from the ropes and a neat cross press, and that's got him. Depends where you were, what type of audience that were there. Uh, if we went to Solihull, the people used to sit there and gentle applause. If we went to Hanley, Stoke on Trent, these people should be climbing in the ring. If we went to Glasgow, you had to have four or five people to get you in the ring and to get you out the ring. 
I was getting a good hide in, in Sheffield one time and suddenly I got quite a pain in my thigh and I looked around and there's a lady wielding an umbrella with a metal spike at the bottom of it and she'd prodded me and I said, ooh, what was that for, love? And she says, no, not you, Jimmy, him, him. <laughs> they run up to the ringside and try to whack you, but I, I was a bit careful not to get too near the ropes. I couldn't help it at times, but, uh, but uh, you know, I, I used to stay away from the ropes as, as much as I could. But uh, yes, one or two uh, did manage to uh, get a poke in the umbrella or whack with a handbag or the shoe or something or whatever they were, anything really that uh, they were carrying at the time, I suppose. The pond screen. You might remember this, but in those days, the pond screen was in a glass jar. Can you imagine that in someone's handbag and they went wallop? Or the fingers on the side of the ring, wallop. Oh, the women are spiteful, definitely. I've been out there and shouted at them and gone up to the ringside. I'm not scared of them. But that's why I get told off by the bouncers, telling me to sit down, get back to your seat. Not they tell me to go outside to calm down. <laughs> I saw Brian Maxine in Glasgow and uh, the crowd got his legs and he held on the ropes like this and the crowd got his legs and they tried to pull him out of the ring and they, his boots were laced up and they were tight and he, they pulled his boots off, they pulled his trunks off and all that was left was him holding on the top rope and they were pulling his legs off, you know, and he wouldn't let go because once he'd let go he went in and crowded to kill him. Where else can you go and shout at somebody and not get smack in the mouth? Someone said it had a great therapeutic value too as well, wrestling, because, um, you know, they could see in me, maybe the, uh, the traffic warden who gave him a parking ticket, the income tax inspector, the, uh, the works foreman, uh, the moaning uh, of brother-in-law or something like that, and, and, and they could really give vent to their feelings, and it was a great, you know, a relief, if you like, for them. A great relieving of tension. This one, anything at all can happen here, but anything. I think it's already started. About to watch while he tries. I've been asked the question a thousand times. Is it fixed? Is it, our business is not a bent business. It's not a fixed business. I didn't say some of the fights were fixed. I didn't say that. I said they're fixed. Not some of them. <laughs> Get my grip. In all my years in the wrestling business, nobody's ever come to me and said to me, you're going to lose. Ref, come round here, look, come round here. Well, I've got a philosophy. There's only one thing straight in life, and that's death. Everything else, they've got an angle. You know, people speculate and they say it's this and they say it's that. How many of these people have been in the ring? How many pe of these people have been dropped on the head? How many of these people have had their arm up the back and the neck twisted around like that? It doesn't look nothing. Don't ever get the idea, because it's a fixed business, that wrestlers don't wrestle. They're great wrestlers. There's great golfers. There's great tennis players. There's great billiard players. But it's easier to put a ball off course, on the course, in a racket, I'm sure. You know, it's a business. Where there's money, there's always angles. What do you say to people who argue that wrestling is a fix? The bottom line, and this is the important factor, they all watched it and they all enjoyed it. And that's really what it is all about. Let's put it this way, look. There is only one straight business in this world and that's wallpapering and that's a put up job. And as I say, have a good time for the last time, I can't do better than to leave the final word to my good friend from Birmingham, the giant bomber himself, Big Pat Roach. I think today is a very, very sad day in history. That is the history of wrestling which has been in our parlours for many, many years now. Television boosted the business. Terrific. But it also killed it, which it does to other things. I think some of the hierarchy and the uh, television people said, well, we want, to get the, we want to get away from the sort of the, the cloth cap set up and, 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 and go for a bit more sophisticated audience. I think we decided to get rid of wrestling because it was a time when ITV uh, was trying to shed its, its old working class down market image. And wrestling almost personified it. When Mr. Shatter took over and everybody was convinced to buy their own houses, they all sort of became mentally 
conservative and wrestling was beneath them. You have to understand, the people who made wrestling, the sports people, by and large, were embarrassed by it because they knew it, was a, it wasn't sport at all. It was a piece of hokum, it was entertainment. Uh, and therefore, they were quite keen to get rid of it. Which I think was stupid because they had this amazing thing going where the people loved it, the fighters loved it, the, uh, the, the, the TV figures were enormous, and I think they should have just left it alone. We are very, very, very sad that in the near future, we will now no longer be in your front parlour. I suppose I was slightly shocked uh, at the reaction, because um, there is a vociferous minority who loved it. And then for a week there was like uproar, in like the mirror and the sun, and there was sort of campaign. Even the Queen Mother got up on the soapbox at one stage. I was then director of programmes at London Weekend, and on one of the shows, which was a current affairs show we made for Channel 4, uh, the producer came up to see me and said, look, we're planning to do this for Sunday, but we just want to make sure. We're planning to send giant haystacks round your house, you know, to interview you about why you scrap wrestling. Do you mind if we give him your address? And I said, do I mind? Of course I bloody mind. Don't you let them near me. Greg Dyke went on to greater things. He's doing other things now and whatever, but uh, at the time, it was, it, it, my, my world collapsed, you know. I was just, I just started on television, I'd done eight, eight appearances, things were happening, bookings were coming left, right and centre, I was out every night. And he's done it! He's beaten the experienced man in just 1 minute 25 seconds of the third round. Well, how about that? Ever to put a feather in his cap. Wonderful effort by young Rob Brookside. It doesn't matter what form of sport or entertainment you're in, without television, you are very quickly yesterday's news. Well, I think I put in the final knife, if that's how you want to describe it, but I don't think, I think there were a few in the body before I got there. I done Croydon of the week, and Croydon used to be one of my favourite places to wrestle, and, and um, I, I was there the other week, and there was like a tear in the eye, because it was, you know, it was sparse. The people were, I mean, the people were great. And the, and the people still are great, the, the people that have followed it, because it's gone underground now wrestling in this country. And without television, it's so hard to put, you know, to put your, your product out. You know, I want to be wrestling the role of all Rocco's. I want to wrestle Rocco in his heyday now, because it's a test for me. The learning place, which was this the wrestling ring, in front of a live audience, has gone in Great Britain. And I feel sorry for that because we were, for a long time in England, the best. We had the best new boys. We had the greatest showmen before America thought of it. Well, there is only one thing to do, and that is the old proverb, go west, young man. The present situation has left us no alternative but to go to America and WCW. So hopefully, very shortly, we'll be part WCW. America, here we come. Everything has a, has a beginning and an end, doesn't it? That's why I said we have a beginning and an end, you know. It's what you do in the middle, I think, which is important. And wrestling, at least wrestling, made its mark. It made such an impression. It made such an impression. It didn't fall by the wayside. It wasn't like a flash in a pan. Oh, I'll put it on for a month, cut the months, and, and that's the end of that. Like, bye bye, you know, try something else. No, it stood the test of time. 33 years, that's the test of time, let's face it. And during all that period, apart from maybe the last maybe year, 18 months, it, it created an, an awful lot of interest for millions and millions and millions and millions of people. And so we bid farewell to these extraordinary entertainers, to Mark Rollerball Rocco, now a successful businessman in Tenerife, to Max Crabtree on his farm, and to Robbie Brookside, off to seek his fortune in America. And of course, to Kendo Nagasaki, to this day, a man of mystery. Will we ever see their like again? <laughs> this is Kent Walton saying, have a good week, till next week. <laughs>